Hi, it's Mav from the future of the episode that you're about to listen to. I'm here with Hannah and Katya for a sad day. Hey, guys. We're having a lot of these lately. Yeah. Yeah, 2020 is relentless. Yeah. Yeah. But yesterday, uh, last night, actually, um, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Mm -hmm. And we recorded the episode that you're about to listen to, uh, I guess, now, almost two weeks ago, you know, obviously before that happened, but we didn't want to, you know, not address it. And so we just thought we'd come in and talk about it for a few for a minute or two before we listen to our regular ridiculousness, because it's I mean, it sucks. It's a horrible day. Yeah. I mean, she's arguably like one of the most important Supreme. I mean, she's certainly I would call her the most important Supreme Court just justice of my lifetime mm-hmm. um, in terms of and I'm like, I won't say that I've agreed with every position or every, you know, uh, stance she's ever taken as, you know, no one, no one will ever align with my politics. Exactly. Obviously. But I think as a, like she is, she is a revolutionary woman in law, and I would say in American society, like she moved the needle substantially in terms of what women could do in public life, um, and, and also a fierce, fierce fighter for women's reproductive health, um, mm-hmm. among other issues. And she wrote uh, to quote my attorney boyfriend, uh, wrote fabulous dissents um, that she's <laughs> well known for. Just yeah. And and I think like, I mean, I think a lot of the, the anguish happening right now is people are concerned about what's going to happen now, because a lot of people, you know, uh, uh, thought of Ruth Bader Ginsburg as one of the people kind of holding the line on a lot of things in our Supreme Court. Um, and so, you know, Women's rightfully rights, so. Civil rights, progressivism in general. It's, right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's understandably a lot of uh, anguish, a lot of fear about kind of what comes next. Um, and whether or not her her you know some of her final words asking that she not be replaced until the new the until the after the presidential election the new president <laughs> yeah that's mm, fingers crossed yeah uh, remains to be seen so well we don't we obviously don't address this again for the rest of this episode because we'd recorded it in our past um but you know we want to talk about it i'm sure like knowing us i'm sure this is going to come up a lot in the coming weeks because clearly some stuff that we don't want to happen is going to start happening so and, and, and you know of course just condolences to all of her family and friends and to the people that she meant so much to which is everybody you know <laughs> well, the nation yeah and, and just solidarity to everyone who's you know a little scared right now or yep. a lot scared as the case may be so now i guess you know we'll return you to our regular scheduled goofiness which will start after the static The weekly pseudo academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with Hannah and Katya and Wayne. Everybody's here, including me. I guess everybody's here. Like you know, I was gone last week, so you know. But hey, guys. Hey. hey. We're all here, and we don't have any guests. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's no no guests to introduce. We don't have to like come up with some fake reason. <laughs> but um. Anyway. Uh, we have Hannah. You you have a topic this week that I thought was interesting. This is one of those weeks where, hey, uh, we don't have anything deep and serious in the news. Um, let's just. I mean, talk there's about, lots of deep and serious in the news, but also we don't have anything deep and serious in the news that we want to talk about. Ears. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to like lean into like joy and enjoy like comfort TV, like. Is this we have so really about joy. <laughs> oh no no no! But but today today I want to complain. Oh okay. <laughs> well, it was your it was your call for comments. What are we doing today? We are talking about our pop culture pet peeves, and by that I don't mean a whole episode de- dedicated to um, Game pets of Thrones. and what annoys us about pets portrayal <laughs> in the media. Though I think that we should definitely do that episode um, because. <laughs> 
that's amazing um, as a topic. I didn't even think of that. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, the little things that annoy us, like it's not awful. It doesn't make us want to turn off our television set. Like, you know, you've heard my rant about Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. We're done. <laughs> it's like done. But this is things like, you know, uh, something annoying will happen and you'll just sigh and deal with it because I mean, like, I hate love triangles. But like, can you name a TV show that doesn't feature at least one of those? Probably so, yeah, not. So, yeah. So these are these are tropes of pop culture, not necessarily TV, though most of mine actually are are TV or movies, but um it doesn't have to be. These are tropes of pop culture that are repeated enough and irritate you every time. Yep. And apparently a lot of our listeners are irritated as well because they left a lot of great comments. <laughs> yes, uh, that works for me. Um, you said you wanted to start with one of the comments, though. You said you said great comments. You want to start with one of them. Yes. OK, so like, as, uh, as I clarified, this is not about animals, but my favorite comment is uh, from Marley. I read this as pet peeve, probably due to the image we posted a sad dog and immediately <laughs> thought the trope where the spy has to kill their beloved pet like in Kingsman. And mm-hmm. yes. I agree. Also, why does the dog always have to die? Also, <laughs> why do cats always have to be the villain? I'm, I'm convinced it's because because dog owners are afraid of cats because cats actually require you know intelligence and cats require. Things. I have a cat. I, I I love my cat. She's awesome because she requires nothing whatsoever. Like mostly, we remember to feed her every day, and she's fine. <laughs> Like you and and really, if we were to forget, if we were to maybe forget, it's the independence, like the independence, yeah. makes people paranoid that your cat can just because like I definitely my cat's old now, but in her in her younger days, she would just kind of like you know fuck off for a day and be like, and then come back the next day and be like, what I was doing things. What do you want? Right. right. There's no you know we don't have to walk the cat. You know you clean the litter every once in a while, but like yeah, it very self sufficient pet. I like them. Yeah, cats are great. I don't understand. It's like cats versus dogs. I was so angry when I went to go see that movie. Cats are not the villain. They're just smart. They're just too smart to be like, yeah, you know, do things. Or they're just, they're they're derpy, but in like a more, no, my cat is probably not that smart. But I also, I'm also very skilled. One of my, one of my major skills in life is picking up runt animals. So if you want a runt animal, just give me a call. I don't know. I can't like give you advice on how to pick one because I don't know. It's just every, literally every pet I have ever picked up in my life is a runt. And not just like a little bit, but like my cat, which is set, who is 17, is the size of an overgrown kitten. Most people think it is a baby. It is not. The worst unit power ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what yeah, are some? I, other- I, said I, had, I said I had a superpower. I didn't say it was good. <laughs> <laughs> what are some? What are some other ones? So, I mean, we're talking about tropes. Um, I, I'm going to link in the show notes. I'm going to link to TVTropes.org, which is just a website that that I enjoy. And I have to give anybody um, sort of a warning that if you're going to go to TVTropes.org, you know, set aside. It's it's like a Wikipedia kind of thing. Set aside six to eight hours because this is a hole that you're going to fall in and then not emerge from as you just so you start you you start seeing things like oh yes but what about on Three's Company wait Three's Company had something in char- in common with the Rifleman yeah and it's like, yeah and you just kind of you just follow from link to link to link and then then you realize oh it's dinner time well let me just look at one more. And then you realize it's bedtime. And then, then like, and six weeks later, we right. emerge from it, your it, cave. It, it, but with yeah. a new wealth of strange and useless knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and if you, if you do indeed fall down that hole, you should leave us a review on iTunes <laughs> or Spotify uh, and tell us what you found. Yeah. And give us a five star review because Mav showed you a thing that's now ruining your brain. <laughs> but, but anyway, you can reward us for that. Well, I yeah, mean, that's, that's what, that's what media is for, isn't it? Yeah. Well, That's what I use YouTube for. So I wonder, should we start with rom coms? Because yeah. rom coms and like specifically romance. love triangle. Well, well, love How triangles because it was the can, one that Hannah mentioned. Can just be the genre of rom coms? No. I like rom coms. No, you can't. You have no I soul. Just- you have no heart or soul. There, there, there are, I mean, there that's are fair. a lot of bad rom coms. Hannah, what is what? See, but here's the thing. What is my media rule? What is the one thing I need to have in a show for me to watch it? We, we've been over this. This is one of the first things I think you'll learn about. There are rom-coms with explosions in them. See Palm Springs Hulu 2020. Palm Springs. Yeah, Palm okay, Springs Okay, fine. Great. I will add it to my list. It's going to be near the bottom. I just find rom-coms... I, okay, I guess this is a pet peeve. I think the reason I stay away from rom-coms, I don't like cringy romances. 
Well, that's what most of them are shit. It's like horror movies. Most of them are shit. <laughs> it's like movies. Most of them are shit. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's so, well, so I mean, like, what are the media. tropes? Make, making good media is really hard. Yeah, what are the out. tropes that annoy you about rom-coms? Because there are a lot. They're, they're I don't really like, bad. It's not even so much... It's, I don't know if this is really tropes. I don't like really sappy things. I don't like... I think especially the thing that rubs me the wrong about, like, and, and I don't mean to be, like, the sort of, like, hashtag feminist that just hates things, but uh, I feel like this could easily go in that direction. I just don't like that the majority of rom-coms, like, the only aspect of, like, any of the characters' lives is they want to fall in love with someone who's kind of mediocre. Okay. Like, well, like take, like, 500 Days of Summer. 500 Days of Summer, yes. I think, is, like, the quintessential for everything that drives me really? nuts about rom-coms. You think that's quintessential? Wow. The, of the things that drive me crazy. Okay. Not necessarily of the genre itself, but it's, like, the manic pixie... There's always, like, this, like, kind of, like, manic pixie... Not always, but there's, like, often, like, the manic pixie dream girl vibe. Mm-hmm. And, like... I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt as an actor. The, I forget the name of the guy in there because he's he's Tom. he's generic as hell. It's not actually important. Tom, just a generic Great. generic name. Great. Like I don't know. Maybe it's just because like guys in rom coms just seem they just seem mediocre. Tom is the most mediocre dude on the planet. He doesn't have a personality. He doesn't have like. I don't know. I just don't. I just. Yeah. I just don't. I don't I think he has a personality. I just. Characters. I just think it's an annoying one. I think yeah. he's a horrible. I think he's a horrible human being, which is sort of uh, part part of what, what I think makes that movie interesting is that he's wrong in every possible way. <laughs> um, also, um, yeah, I, but that movie yeah. also. I guess that's the thing is it's like the, the, the but that movie still wants you to sympathize with him. Does it? It does. Yes. It really like it. It, it like it. It collapses in on itself in that it yeah. thinks it's like New Girl. Sorry, New Girl, which does feature <laughs> an amazing cat, Ferguson. Um, but it's like New Girl, which actually both of these star Zoe De Chanel. They like are critiquing sometimes the like tropes of like Mag Pixie Dream Girl and like you know the man like putting his own desires on like the woman but really mm-hmm. like it just right. circles back around and actually like well, we do- they don't do it forcefully enough i think because yeah. i think you can want like like you have to to me you have to go to five hundreds of summer and want to see that narrative in it rather than that movie actually promoting the like critique itself if that makes sense like i think i've seen at least the first i think like two seasons of new girl I think New Girl does a slightly better job of it, it but does. again, when she starts getting, like, I think I stopped watching it so, shortly after, like, she starts dating the kind of, like, again, the mediocre crappy dude. <laughs> Which uh, could describe almost any romantic relationship in that show. Yep. Yes. Um, and, and I'm just like, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to watch, like, an otherwise, like, smart and funny girl get in a relationship with mediocre dude because he's the only body in the room. <laughs> like, well, not, yeah, yeah. No. yeah. Well, so I want to give the comment from uh, Carolyn Salvi, who's been on our show uh, a mm-hmm. few weeks ago, but her comment was uh, regarding the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Um, it's a vehicle for perpetuating the Victorian ideal of the angel in the house and teaching people that it's wi- that it's woman's job to do all of the emotional labor. I have a lot to say about this. Um, yeah. Yes, it, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also for the record anyone who doesn't know what an angel in the house is it's literally what it sounds like like a woman creates a domestic space you know like think about even just like 1950s housewife like man comes home and like there is like a drink and like dinner for him and like all this other blah this which which by the way sounds great but it's not a person (laughs) yeah you want you want an animate sex doll like that's that's then how to cook. Oh, wow. I wasn't even thinking about, I just I just wanted I just wanted the whiskey. I wasn't even thinking about the sex part. Yeah, the sex part would be great too. Um no, I was just thinking, you know, if I just walked in the door and someone handed me a whiskey, not even at home, just any door I walked through, that would be great. You know. You want Rosie from the Jetsons. I just want whiskey. <laughs> I hadn't put that much thought into it. Um but well, so I have a question though. I have a manic pixie dream girl question because um given the complaint that that Carolyn made, and to a lesser extent, what Katya was saying, but you know, I think it's mixed in. Um, does my flaw, my problem with the manic pixie dream girl is usually the opposite. Um, in that I w- when I get annoyed with with the manic pixie dream girl, it's not when she's doing all the emotional labor when she's the angel of the house. It's when she is nothing but a vehicle of weirdness, you know, for the which. I mean, I guess that this doesn't happen in rom com so much as you know, just sort of guy movies. You know, there's mm-hmm. the quirky girl whose job is to be quirky because that's the 
you know, if she were a sex symbol, that would be unattainable. No, she's just the quirky one of those one of the guys girls whose job it is to. There's no emotional labor. It's literally she's an objective. Yeah, it's, it's the I'm not like the other girls kind of yes. manic dream girl. Yeah, which also like that's another pop culture trope, which is not limited to TV or film. But we can get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that those. I feel like those are two different subsets of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. There's the emotional labor, like, please, please, like, rehabilitate me of, like, the often frequent, like, Zoe Deschanel. And I don't mm-hmm. mean to put that in Zoe Deschanel, but often the characters that she plays, she's kind of, like, put into that role because I think, like, there's a whole thing, I think, with the way that people project things under Zoe Deschanel in particular and women like her. But anyway, so that kind of, like, character. But yeah, I, I definitely, like... I yeah I just I dislike that entire narrative that happens. Mm-hmm. And I just I I don't nope. I think especially because like I think the thing that rubs me the wrong way about that is that so often when you have like the quirky girl trope, mm-hmm. it's like how do I want to say this? It's often used in pop cult in like like nerd culture. I think as like an excuse for like as an excuse or not excuse a like pale substitute for actual feminism. Is it somehow because her boobs aren't hanging out? And she has like some personality traits that aren't like associated with the femme fatale. Then she's therefore ah yes, we as as you know straight dudes can like fa- like fangirl out over this like mm-hmm. character, and it's not gross. It's like no, no, it's 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 a different brand of problematic. But it's a, well, it's a validation of it's a validation of I'm not like the other guys because I'm not lusting after you know Playboy playmates. I'm lusting after w- real women. All real women look like Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> Right. Well, not even all real women look like it's Zoe Deschanel, but they look like an idealized version of Zoe Deschanel that lives in right. their heads who, like, when right. they come home, has whiskey at the door kind of thing. Yes. Yes. Um, I would I would correlate this to is a, another rom-com complaint of mine, which is like sort of the um, the opposite character, which I just find irritating, is the male version of this. And it's not the quirky dream girl. It's the it's the bad boy who just needs the girl. It, 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 these are usually focused at women. As a, so, you know, the, the female is the protagonist and you've got the bad boy who is just he just hasn't met the right girl yet. So it's it's taming, taming the guy in the leather jacket. So like literally um, I, like Mark McGurl, who's a like literary critic, came to Mi- not Mississippi State Duke and gave a talk. And he talked about like the billionaire, like playboy um, who was an mm-hmm. asshole like Rochester. Or even like a prototypical Mr. Darcy, though honestly, Mr. Darcy is probably a little nicer. But mm-hmm. like you know, a Christian Gray kind of figure, pretty I think woman, that, Chris, um, yeah. Fifty Shades of Gray, Fifty Shades of Gray, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. just I, I think Christian Gray. Not that I've been able to make my way through all five hundred pages of Fifty Shades of Gray. Um, <laughs> Why so would you just? If you have to just watch the movies and just feel sad afterwards, yeah. Sometimes um, you want about know about throbbing man root, Katya. I'm gonna just I'm sorry. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> the quality of the quality of writing in that book. <laughs> I remember. I think I like looked at a bookstore, and I think I don't know if I just saw like a shitty like first edition, but I swear I opened the first like opened it, turned to a page, and found two typos, and was just like, nope. I didn't think I was that kind of like literary snob, but apparently in that moment I was like, no, just no. <laughs> um, but I. I have not made my way through it. I have not made my way through the movies. But I think that, like, the reason why that book in particular is critiqued so much is because, like, the billionaire asshole just, like, reaches his peak of, like, terribleness in the figure of Christian Grey. Um, mm-hmm. And the writing reaches its peak of terribleness. Um, sorry, James. I don't know why I'm apologizing. You're rich. It's fine. <laughs> um <laughs> Wayne, do you have any in the in the rom rom com category? Um, I don't. I like you. I mean, I I don't absolutely dislike rom coms, but it's not a genre I just immediately search out. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been ones I've liked. I yeah, I it's same thing. Just so much of it. I guess my my biggest uh, pet peeve with any of that stuff is just the repetition of the tropes. You know, like this yeah. is mm-hmm. this is every other rom com I've ever seen. Oh, it's a love mm-hmm. triangle. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. And you know, and I think with any of those things. There are examples of it being done well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the the pix, the manic pixie dream girl thing. Yeah, you Mav, you and I were about to fight over Audrey Hepburn a while back, and she sort oh. of epitomizes that. Well, yeah, it's her mm-hmm. entire career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, well, but, not but quite, she did but some, most of it. Yeah, yeah she did some really good movies mm-hmm. playing that role and and did it really mm-hmm. well. And um, we, I mean, we talked on an earlier episode about um, 
uh, about Edge of Seventeen, which she is. What makes that movie work is she is the manic pixie dream girl, but it's from her point of view. Mm-hmm. And then you and the entire film is realizing she is not what she, she is more than that. Yeah, right. And in fact, and in fact she's an objectively horrible person. You know, yeah, she's, yeah. I, I love well, that film, but she's. I, I think awful. it's also you know that you're talking about the uh, the the movie tropes, the website, whatever that's called. TV I, I see. Yeah. I, and I see, you know, and I mean, tropes are, are, you know, they are what they are for whatever reasons, but there's also, you know, tropes are also cliches. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's a starting point and you can do good things with them or bad things with them. I mean, my, my Jungian background, and I was going to talk, if I was going to, if I did my paper last year on Wicked and Divine, one of the quotes I was going to use from Karen Gillan is you know, him deconstructing <laughs> reference back to this week's episode. Um, some of the the cliches and the the archetypes and you can have you know, archetypes are, are seen as here's this intellectual model but you know, he says you know, archetypes are are cliches with a phd <laughs> <laughs> and 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 i really like that t-shirt it, yeah and it, and it challenges a lot of things i've gone into this with because that's been a a model for the way i think about a lot of this stuff for a long long time but it's true you know like yes archetypes can be incredibly powerful and they can be repetitive as fuck Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I see that the same thing. The idea of the trope. So much of that movie trope is, oh, this is the Manny Pixie Dream Girl, and a lot of people use that to just immediately dismiss that type across the board. Oh, sure, mm-hmm. but there can, but and, some good and, movies can and, can and have that. good things. Yeah. Yeah, and I you know, and I this hit me. I was reading um, some reviews. I I, I read a, a biography of Herman Hesse a year or so ago for a a book review that I never got published, never got paid for because of the ongoing you know, collapse of the newspaper industry in America. Uh, I, I, that, that's why I didn't get paid. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Herman Hesse is a, a classic writer that I have liked a lot over the years. He's not without his problems like any, you know, whatever. But I was doing some more research on it and they, someone, you know, some online you know, Amazon review kind of thing referred to the character of Hermione in that book as, oh, she's nothing but a manic pixie dream girl. It's like, you're right, but boy, are you missing a whole lot of other stuff in that book. And it was just used, it was used to dismiss. Well, and that's. Is she a manic pixie dream girl? I guess that's not. Yeah, and, and that's it. Like, there's an aspect. Like, I, I can totally see that like, there's aspects of that, but like yeah, that. Right. I, I, and that's it. She's, that, to me, that is such I think a selfish reason. The other problem reading. is also like any. The issue is also like, I feel like Manic Pixie Dream Girl is also like a spectrum because it's like. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's every I mean, because of the way like the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is just basically patriarchy was on steroids distilled into a character like, mm-hmm. yeah, in, 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 in any kind of like equal, not quite opposite, but like different trajectory as like the, the very extreme femme fatale kind of like, you know, sex pot persona. Mm-hmm. But like every female character, like, it would be very difficult to, to have a fem- like write a female character that doesn't have some elements of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl or the Femme Fatale or the Sex Pot or whatever. Or any of them, yeah. yeah. Right, or a mixture that's what of all of them are. because... Because because guess what women women are multifaceted people with multiple. Yeah. Well, no, well, well, as our, I mean, I, I mean, same thing. With, same thing with the bad boy that I that I complain yeah. about, right? right. Like exactly. Like, archetypes are basic character types. If, I mean, if you're right. to go back to like to to go back to um, last week's episode for the listener, when you guys are talking about you know you guys are talking about characters and races and 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 role playing games, the reason that happens is because you know you have a general set and then like it's the deviations from it. See, I have trouble calling Hermione a manic pixie dream girl because yeah, I mean, she is a girl, but she's not terribly well, manic. I, 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 I she think, doesn't. You know, I, I think, but his definition of it was, Oh, here's this young woman who either cliche, the young woman who takes this old man and gets him out of his shell and introduces him to dancing and sex and opioids and, okay. you know, and, and, and you know, sure. and, and that cliche of you know the young the young woman representing this old man's lost soul or whatever it is. So and, and, yeah, and but, but if you take they, Harry they can, Potter, if you take Harry Potter, yes, Hermione is the young man because the book's about thirteen year olds and they're hmm. all young. Well, no, like, this, this, no, this is Hermione and Steppenwolf. Oh, okay, yeah. uh, okay. See, that yeah. makes a lot more sense because I wasn't I wasn't yeah. clear on that. Okay, I'm yeah, like, no, no, the character from Hermione. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah you didn't. And, 
Oh, okay, that makes well, more no, sense. No, no, I, no, well, no, I was talking about Steppenwolf when I said the character of Hermione. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so if you want to erase this entire last ten minutes, no, 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 <laughs> no, nope, we should leave it in because this that makes so much more sense. Makes now. way more sense yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah, I'm on yeah. board now. No, no yeah, Her, Hermione, and and she is also very overtly. The book is incredibly youngy, and he was in therapy with the young when he was writing it. Uh, <sighs> Hermione is also very much meant to be his anima. Um, so it's, it's an aspect of himself, uh, not just an external huh. young woman but, who comes and takes him out and teaches him to dance. Okay. But see that returns exactly to Katya's earlier point, which is now her, her sole function is, I mean, she's, she's the angel in the house, forget, right? Like she, her sole function is just providing right, the so emotional she, fix for the. So even if well, the character doesn't fit the trope, she's fulfilling the same Function right, yeah, yeah, she's the fulfilling that function, yes, and and certainly right. that was written many many years before the term manic pixie dream girl. But I just I found right. that that reference is just so dismissive of, and, and I, I fully admit it, it's a book that has been meaningful to me in my life, and I was like, wait, what? What do you mean? You know, um, but it, it just felt so dismissive, and it just felt like, oh, here's this internet trope I read about. Oh, that's right. all this is. It's this internet trope, and. There's so much more going on in layers in that book. And yes, she fulfills that role. Absolutely. But there's mm-hmm. so much more to that character to just dismissive, dismiss well, it. And I it's mean, the same thing I say with the architect rather than just say, oh, that character's, right. character's powerful because he's the wise old man. Well, no, that can be crap, you know? Right. Well, f- and fiction is, you know, fiction is, you know, they're stories. They're not real people. They, so, yes, a character has a thematic role in a thing. Um, I have a question for Hannah before we move off these, though. Yeah. Like, what was your specific reason for the hating of love triangles in general? Because I have one specific thing that was on mine uh, that I think is a subset of love triangles. But why do you hate them? Well, one, because like they're everywhere, like to the point that it's like, guys, come on. Can't you just show us like one happy, like long term relationship without like breaking someone? I mean, like this is more specific than like more general than love triangles, like breaking someone up or killing someone off or like having people like just be terrible for no reason like Grey's Anatomy Izzy and George uh, sleep together and like George is married and it's like coming up with genuine conflict is hard Hannah. I know, you, but you, you, actually, you, actually, you actually want people to write and come up with original content when it's so much easier like, to just kill people or make them into horrendous humans or like are you know like uh, friends the reason I mean like don't get me wrong the like characters on friends are yes like terrible people for the most part but part of the reason they're terrible people is because they the writers even basically said this Ross and Rachel got together too early um in terms of like how long the series lasted for them to continue will they won't they will they won't they and they just kept dragging it out and having them get married mm-hmm. and then divorced and they get married to each other and then divorced and like joey you know and it, it like it just made them just like more terrible than they had to be mm-hmm. and it's just needless to, and I, i'm not saying that you can't have feelings for multiple people at once or like you can't do a well-done love sure. triangle but most of the time it's not well done and mm-hmm. It just it's and even when it is well done, it gets repetitive after a certain point. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's also like, upsetting to watch. Like unless it's like, yeah. you know, someone in a like polyamorous relationship or like consensual, like ethical non monogamy, it's like, why do you have to be like all skeevy and cheating on people? Why can't you just like <laughs> be honest about your feelings and be a decent person? I don't know. I just find this really personal, even though like I've not been in a love triangle. I don't know. Um that's probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> Who hurt you, Hannah? Please. <laughs> Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy hurt me. Ross. <laughs> so, We've all been individually victimized by Ross. To be so fair, you- yeah. Ross has, like, victimized all of us. I, no, just Ross Geller has victimized all of us, especially those of us with, like, PhDs and his, like, bull gonna, crap. Yeah. Anyway. He, he- he, he doesn't. He doesn't give us a good name. No. <laughs> you hit on a couple things though that I, like. So my my main problem with love triangles. I don't. I, I don't have as many feelings as Hannah does. Um, but, but the one part of it that I really that really really bugs me is I do not like the love triangle that requires the loser of the triangle. You know so. The so you know, depending and this is not gender specific because it it happens in in boy girl girl and boy boy girl um triangles mm-hmm. um but one the loser of the triangle has to suddenly be an asshole 
so as to not feel bad for them when the person in the middle of the triangle picks the winner. <laughs> and I, mm-hmm. and I, I, I hate that. Um, if, if I'm going to see it, I actually I actually don't mind a, a movie where the love triangle is OK. Um, uh, you know, quirky, manic, pixie, dream girl, heroine, you know, quirky, quirky protagonist lady um, is in love with two boys and they're both kind of great. And she likes things about both of them. And how does she choose? Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting conundrum. And like, you know, and again, assuming you're not going to go the polyamorous route, she's got to make a decision. And I understand her emotional struggle, but usually what a film does is, well, you've got the nice boy and you've got the guy who's secretly an asshole and he's actually cheating on her or he's, you know, he's running drugs on the side or, you know, but he's got to have some fatal flaw so that you don't feel bad about him when, um, right, because it doesn't have to, and it won't also just make it so there's not an actual decision, not just for the woman in the film, but for the viewer to the want to take sides. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. It's like we can't, we can't, we can't have, we want conflict, but easy conflict, not too much. Yeah. It has to be like, mm-hmm. or there's always like, like negative, when it, especially when it comes to women, there's also these negative defaults because for example, you're watching a TV show and at one point the guy has left his abusive ex-girlfriend and he's moved on to someone who he actually has a healthy relationship with and there's not really a triangle but because the writers are sexist douchebags, they're like, you know what? He needs to go back to his abusive ex-girlfriend because she's pretty and like strong women who like are good at physical fights who are not conventionally attractive by certain like standards can't like win and they need to focus on their professional lives because women cannot have love and a job at the same time not that, that was, not that you guys know I, what I, i'm just, talking about I, I, no I, I just love that you that you you pretended that you were just making a random example and not and, and not just squeezing like the, the rant that you keep saying you don't want to do anymore I, <laughs> they, me. Of they victimize me i'm victimized by television okay well, okay, so it does it does call the you know because this moves away from just specifically rom coms into yeah. what I thought was my big trope that really bothers me more, which was the other thing, which is I hate status quo reset. I hate 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 status quo reset. Um, this happens in serialized forms of media of all types. So it happens a lot in comic books. It happens, it happens a lot in, in soap operas. It happens in in sitcoms it's the you know you said ross and rachel had to keep breaking up and keep breaking up and create in in order to keep the will they won't they going they had to just sort of reset because the story needs to be about that and i was like no like um wayne we've talked about this um in in um in the marvel universe and comic books they did fucking backflips of and crazy deals with the devil and all kinds of ridiculousness because they wanted to erase the mar- the marriage of Spider-Man because they thought it was more interesting to have him, you know, trying to trying to get the girl. I guess you quit reading when that happened. Yeah. And I don't like like I'm I mean, yes, it's interesting seeing Spider-Man like learn to fall in love. But you can have an interesting story about Spider-Man, the middle aged married guy. That's fine. You know. It, you know, you don't have to keep resetting. You don't have to keep resetting the story over and over again. And, and I, so, so I somebody, feel that way some, about you know somebody at Marvel like, still believes that the basic readership for Spider Man is fifteen year old instead of the only forty five year old men. Fifteen year old, fifteen years old, and they never turn sixteen. They just disappear, and a new yeah. fifteen year old comes in. And I don't, I, I don't need that to happen at Marvel. I don't need that to happen on Friends. Um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> Had, had it a little bit, but not as you know, not as much because it's you know it's a more limited series. But like the but the the thing that Hannah was just complaining about. Uh, let's just erase everything that you've learned and have that same problem again. Mm-hmm. Friends was all that. Like it, it, mm-hmm. you know, I don't mind if Ross and Rachel break up. I don't mind if they get together and be married. But the story can progress and we can see the next phase of their life. I, I you know, either way is fine. I well, just- that's, that's why Mock and Chandler, if we were just talking about friends, are the better couple because like they had they develop. like a, they had a development. Like if if Ross and Rachel like stopped breaking up and like just did their own thing they would have just been better people because it wouldn't Mm -hmm. have been so toxic which is or or, and also just kind of like hard to watch because you're just embarrassed for them after a certain point Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it just becomes like painfully awkward i think it was like back to like the cringy aspect where it's just like i don't know like to be like the cringy aspect is just like any like those moments in a rom-com where not even like i need it to be realistic because hello movies 
But like, yeah, it's just like this isn't fun to watch at a, after a certain point. Mm-hmm. Like, it's no longer even interesting conflict of like, because you know there are couples in real life that like break up and get back together, break up and get back together, and like not that it needs to be realistic to be interesting, but like there's an in- there could be an interesting story there. If you're if you're that couple, then I want your friends to go Jesus Christ again. You know, like I I, I want right. you know, I want that to be part of the story to have right. people like recognize that this is screwed up, right? Rather right. than just like the universe. Mm-hmm. suddenly everyone's minds are erased and like it's not a thing anymore and, and this happens i mean this happens in action movies too like i don't it's i mean mm-hmm. there are there there are some movies john, john wick is not really a story john wick is an excuse to put keanu in in gun fu situations right but like the storyline of each of the three films effectively the same thing the desperado movies um by by robert rodriguez um, el mariachi desperado like there nothing matters it's literally just an excuse to get you into these gunfights but like if if you've got a character who um who tony stark in the iron man movies um he and it changes a little it changes a little bit by the avengers movies but iron man one and two and three and to a lesser extent sort of you know like the spider-man movies where he's the guest star it's like you, dude you you learned this lesson already <laughs> you know yeah. you've become a better person why are you going back to being the that oh, guy well yeah the the idiot scientist like you you've right. progressed um and i and i want to believe that you can solve more interesting problems i know you can solve more interesting problems because sometimes you do you don't need to reset me to the to the status quo so much and this happens um, this is this is very common on 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 soap operas um, because mm-hmm. you know, it's just the net, the nature of how soap opera are, operas are filmed. So that was that was See, mine. I I think like the, my, my question with this stuff is like like I mean a lot of what we're coming back to goes to these repetitive storylines either when it's within the same like movie franchise or like TV series, but like how much of that is people like watching the same like the They're same story over and over right because it's a comfortable storyline do it, it like is part of the attraction of friends is that you kind of already know what's gonna happen probably i mean but mm. there's there's comfort you know and but but i mean that's how something becomes a trope right like you know you can complain about the manic pixie dream girl all you want the reason they keep making movies is because those movies is because people go to see the movie with the manic pixie dream girl and they read the novels and they have since you know like like Hannah said, since Victorian times, right? Like going back to Pride and Prejudice, that character sells. So people keep writing mm-hmm. that character. So I think there's something, but that doesn't mean that it can't annoy, you know, like something becomes a trope because it happens it over and over again and then it can annoy us. It's fine. At least I think. I mean, you don't have to tell me that it's fine to be annoyed. It's kind of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But the, you know, I, I think that part of like some of the like reasons that stories were the way they were was because of some of like l- the limitations of like what kinds of stories you could tell on like TV or like in comics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now like things have changed a bit. Like they're, they're like I mean like Friday Night Lights um it had like one of the first like marriages I could remember where they actually gave like uh, the coach and his wife like a real like marriage and had them have conflicts without breaking them up. Um, mm-hmm. and that worked really well and people loved it like the reason why people still love that show is because I mean of other relationships too, but specifically because that relationship was so good and because they did new things instead of just like ooh look a teenage football drama let us <laughs> <laughs> Which like it's not about football at all. Like you know, let us let us yeah, just know, show I, these I, I, like yeah. same things over and over again. I mean, the reason why um, people like crapped upon new Star Wars is because it didn't like it kept doing things that it was seen before. It wasn't old Star Wars. Yeah, uh, well, it was well, old, it was all, it was, old, it, was old, it was not old Star Wars, but also it was too much like old Star Wars. Like Andrew mm-hmm. Demon. Uh, That's true commented i aggressively hate the trope that the reformed villain has to achieve atonement by sacrificing themselves for the hero it's a convenient way yeah. to prevent exploring an actual redemption narrative and works against the very concept of rehabilitation mm-hmm. by positing that the life of the former villain has no value except in relation to the protagonist it's also just super lazy writing see kylo ren yep I mean, and uh, also yes. Darth Vader. that was like yeah. the biggest letdown of that movie it's just like you you could have done a cool thing and then you didn't 
Also, mm-hmm. like we mm-hmm. should have just never had that stupid Raylo relationship, but well, it's but it, but it's that it's it's um, it's Kylo, it's Darth Vader, it's Killmonger. Well, Killmonger is a little different because Killmonger doesn't redeem himself. Killmonger dies because he doesn't want to be redeemed. Um, but like that, but yeah, that is kind of a you know, oh, I'm sacrificing myself to Doc save Ock. the day. So I'm especially, well, especially like like that actually reminds me of another kind of like not just a rom com trope, but a like I mean, it is like a a, a romance trope, I guess. Uh, but like the idea, I mean, so part of the reason that that Star Wars movie kind of is also cringy in my mind is every like I swear I would love to see more movies where like there could be a male lead and a female lead that do not end up having some kind of weird romantic relationship because in that movie it is so forced and bizarre. Also, mm-hmm. I don't feel like Adam Driver should have been the male lead. The male lead should have been John Boyega based on the first movie, but we don't have to do Star Wars mm-hmm. again. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but yes, well, this, this expectation that's like if you have if you have like two major characters of the opposite sex, they must obviously mm-hmm. have a romantic relationship. But it's like like why why like I realize that is attraction movie. by proximity, <laughs> right? And it's like there's there's no like. There's no, especially because it's like there's no real narrative reason or attraction or like chemistry. Than, anything that other makes than sense. It just it's just expected that there will be a romance here, right? Yeah, and I don't know if it was some kind of like fan service thing. It's not really fan service, but like uh, I think well in the. In that one, in the specific one that that we were talking about, the the Ray Kylo thing, I I see no other reason. Uh, it it was fan service because it doesn't it doesn't yeah. make. And and you know what? Honestly, here here's the thing, JJ, you're a better director than that. And I'm not yeah. saying JJ Abrams is the best director in the world. I'm saying you're a better storyteller than that. You, He's you know, literally a better was, storyteller than that. Like, yeah. I mean, it's not hard. It's it's not a high bar. No, the right. two it was one of the worst narrative decisions I've seen in a minute. Yes, I, mean, I, like, I, I 100% but, but agree. Some people were so into it. Some people are so yeah. happy about it. And I, uh, yeah, they, they really it's are. So it's crazy. Crazy. Yes, it's, it's gross. So it's so gross. Um, mm-hmm. But I will say, I will defend JJ Abrams and say he. Like everybody who worked on that movie basically was dealt like the worst hand possible by Disney. Um, and it was all a mistake. Um, <laughs> and we're honestly, I'm surprised it came out as good as it did. Uh, mm-hmm. but like, oh, but speaking of Star Wars, uh, we have another comment from Paul Malone that's, I hate the whole chosen one trope where the protagonist yeah. with only cursory training, period, and their natural talent becomes yeah. the best ex in the world in a week or during a three minute <laughs> montage. It's particularly galling when it's a white person who becomes the greatest ninja, Sioux warrior, slash gangster rapper, slash Venezuelan <laughs> space yacht pilot. Um, but it's annoying under any circumstances. I much prefer to root for a hero who works like hell to become barely competent enough to survive. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, I agree with yes. 100% of that statement and enjoy the mic drop of that. So I'm just going to yeah. Indiana Jones is cooler than Luke Skywalker is what he's saying. But also, can we just say that like uh, Harry Potter is should have died? Can we, I'm sorry. I realize this is a different rant, but also... Harry Potter is a mediocre dude. Yeah, he's I'm a mediocre sorry. Dude. Like, well, I mean, like, there's also like, I mean, that's part of like a lot of these teenage protagonist trope things. Um, a lot of them like yeah. don't have personalities or talents. Also, lots. I think also like lots of this is particularly true of fantasy and sci-fi lead characters in a lot of fantasy and sci-fi like stories are not across the board. But regularly kind of vapid. And I think like and there there is an actual genre reason for that. It's because especially when you're looking at YA fiction, like part of the reason authors like will sometimes make that decision consciously is so that the reader can like place themselves in the protagonist's yeah. shoes. We can have a whole different conversation about what it means that that character is ninety percent of the time a straight white dude. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what that means for, you know, readers that are not that, but that's a different that's a different conversation. Mm-hmm. Um so like like in fantasy and sci-fi, like I understand why it happens, but I think it makes it so much I don't know. It's just I think especially when it's something like Harry Potter, where it becomes like cult status mm-hmm. in a way that people get kind of like uh frantic about. I don't know. Like there's even I think there's even less of a like desire to have like this introspective, mm-hmm. like, is this actually a like a character I want to be invested in, even if I'm invested in the overall story of the world. And I mean, there's been a whole bunch of stuff with JK Rowling, mm-hmm. re e transphobia and all that kind of stuff that I think a lot of people well, should be having that introspection. But like, 
speaking as a hashtag millennial, who I'm supposed to be of the generation that loves Harry Potter with undying fervor. I just, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't think I ever will. But I, I think also, the, I, and this is a different pet peeve. And I, I would be interested to hear your side on it. I think part of the reason I did not, I, well, I know part of the reason I was not super into Harry Potter as a kid mm-hmm. is because I read hundreds of hours of fantasy before that. And I don't want to be the annoying hipster person of like, oh, I knew about fantasy before it was cool. <laughs> but it was also like when I got to Harry Potter, I'm like, this is fun. This is a fun book. It's cool. I enjoy it. But also like. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's not it revelatory. Lot, it, no, it does. a lot. It, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of really common tropes of fantasy and executes them, you know, relatively well in a YA space. Mm-hmm. It's well, not most people, a, most people don't read as much as much as well, as much as you do now either, but as much as you did then probably, you know, if you're, yeah, you're, yeah that, that's kind of exactly what I was going to say. We're all inundated in, you know, in this stuff. Like we've all spent in order to I always made it. about like back when, back when I was in college, there was this point where the show Babylon five was this, this science fiction show that everybody was super mm-hmm. like people were so into, but have you seen Babylon five? And, and I was like, yeah, I saw it. I didn't really like it. How could you not like it? It's the greatest show ever. And I'm like, well, no. And it's like, it's ama- so amazing. There's nothing like it. And I'm like, no, I've watched tons of stuff that's like that. It's, it's the only thing you've ever seen that's like that. It just wasn't for me. You know, the, to, it was the first big American serialized science fiction show on television. Right. Um, and, but like other ones existed. It's just that, you know, it, it it was innovate it was innovative to people who hadn't seen anything else exactly like it and so i i think that there's there's this thing with with harry potter to go back to your your older point of like the not being interesting i think that it worked because he's a relatively blank slate i mean even the chosen one narrative that's in it they they you know she goes out of her way to say well anybody could have been the chosen one it could have just as easily have been neville and it's kind of it's trying to invert the chosen one narrative and say you know you too can be the chosen one you too can be born special um just because you know because your mother loves you whose mom does i mean not everybody whose mother loves them but i mean that's like Voldemort, you yeah. know Right. So it's nice. So I don't know. I, well, especially that narrative like downplays. I mean, Harry Potter is a good example, but again, this happens all over the place. Like Harry Potter downplays the importance of like how much teamwork plays in saving the world and all of that mm-hmm. stuff. Like it's not just Harry Potter, but it kind like but the story centers around him so much that it kind of like dismisses, you know, mm-hmm. the importance of Ron in some of the books, the importance of Hermione in the books, of Neville, of all these like other characters because yeah, Ron's not important. Harry's always the chosen one. And it is there are points where I think the novels like mm-hmm. kind of poke fun at that a little bit, but mm-hmm. it still kind of falls back into this like every time it comes it starts to dig itself out of that hole, it still just falls back into it, which like a lot of these stories, I think especially YA novels, because YA novels tend to like be more even more tropey than others. Mm-hmm. Well, I wanted to go because one of mine was the opposite of that. You're ta- you're you're talking about the mediocrity of him. Um, one of my um my my biggest pet peeves is in serialized media, either a series of novels. Uh, it doesn't really happen much within one story, but it happens a lot from from novel to novel or from movie to movie. I don't like when people massively level up. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> um when and, and and we're now Harry Potter Harry Potter mostly doesn't do this. He's you know like I find that like from his being 12 or 13 however old he is in the first book well, eight, I guess he's 11 because there's seven books. So mm-hmm. from, from being 11 to being 18 he more or less follows a level of emotional development that I uh, not emo- emotion, oh, emotional and character development. Given how powerful he is at 11, I buy he's roughly as powerful as he is at, at 18. Sure. Um, what I don't like is when people score experience points between movies or book and therefore are just super badass because that makes because they're in order to raise the stakes people are just more badass than ever and like the best example i always use i can use for this is um is die hard because Mm. for the for the movie die hard what makes it interesting is you know he is just a regular guy who doesn't belong in this situation he is you know he's the for the first film one of the one of the driving parts of the narrative is he doesn't have any shoes <laughs> you know, i've got no shoes and my feet hurt because there's glass you know, like that's that's a that's a major problem for him that you know how do you how do i walk across glass when i have no shoes 
And then like three movies later, he's shooting himself in the in the stomach to hit the guy behind him because he's just developed like near in in human, you know, in human levels of superpower of badassness that like just in order to raise the stakes, he becomes more and more. You know, uh, the first blood is a deep character drama about having PTSD being a Vietnam War vet. And then by the later Rambo movies, it's, you know, I can kill 247 people in 90 minutes. <laughs> you know, like that, like that is <laughs> <laughs> like, do you not know, again, the first, the first Rambo movie and first blood, there is one death. One guy dies in the entire movie. One. And it's an accident. <laughs> but like later and later, he's just machine gunning people left and right because they're just, you know, they're they're That's the movie. We, we've got to build up your badassery between films. Um, Katniss, Katniss mostly survives the first Hunger Games by accident. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know? she also mostly um, survives like all of the Hunger Games series by she, accident. Yeah. Right. But, but by the end, of, yes, but by the end of the, um, like the Hunger Games, actually, that entire novel series progresses way better if she's just not there. Like she's not around. Like their life, everybody's life goes better. But, um, <laughs> but that said, by the end of it, she's damn near a superhero with her level of badassery. And, you know, uh, she still is annoying in many ways. And I like those films, but I, 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 I'm not saying she's perfect. I'm saying, actually, I don't like the films. I like the books a lot. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm- um, she's still, she's still not, you know, not perfect by the end of it. But she has certainly developed a from a okay. Well, I guess I know how to use a bow, so I guess that's going to be my weapon. Right. To warrior to the, ninja, to, yeah. Till she's the green arrow so, <laughs> at the end. For, though I will say no that thing. like those books are the exact opposite of like what Katya is complaining about in terms of mm-hmm. Harry Potter. Like one dude saves the world. Like mm-hmm. the Mockingjay shows like how little she actually does like there's a whole like underground organization that's like kind she of running the about. show yeah like well first of all she doesn't even know about how she gets involved and secondly they like use her as like a prop because like those books are all about like media and like the mm-hmm. power of symbols and you know commentary mm-hmm. on reality tv and well you know we saw the films we read them yeah <laughs> kind of related to what Matt's talking about though i think like Hunger Games, and I am less versed in the Hunger Games than pretty much everyone else on this show, probably. But, like, it, it reminds me of uh, one of the things I wrote down uh, for my notes is, like, the Mary Sue trope. So mm-hmm. for those people who don't know what a Mary Sue is, it's I want to do a whole show on Mary Sue's at some point. Yeah, there's also an entire, like, nerd website, which I highly endorse, uh, named after Mary Sue's. But Mary mm-hmm. Sue's are basically, like, generally used to describe female characters who are, like, perfect and i'm not just and i'm not talking about like astonishingly beautiful although they're also often attractive but like basically has no flaws or weaknesses and this was like mary sue's kind of like emerged out of a out of like a positive desire to like portray the quote-unquote strong women in particularly nerd culture um that i think went too far (laughs) yeah and and kind of similar to that is like also like the strong female character in general, I think is also like kind of mm-hmm. going back to what we're talking about, Manny Pixie Dream Girls, I think has the similar but opposite problem of like like there's this period I th- I think of this a lot with Joss Whedon. Um and things like Firefly, which I enjoy Firefly. It's you know one of my favorite TV shows because I'm that cliched nerd. Um but like Joss Whedon a lot of times he has like female, especially his female leads, like have how do I want to say this? They're uh, Kitty Pride. Joss Whedon's been trying to. Right. Joss Whedon has written has written K- Kitty Pride into every story that he's done in the last thirty years. And right. and like, he acknowledges it too. So yeah, and I think like and and there are characters within his universe that I think are are more complicated than others. But it, like there's it's I think especially when Joss Whedon was kind of like producing this most of his work, I think it was difficult to write a female character in a nerd genre that was realistic. And I mean that in the sense of like having having a full being like having character flaws having and and having strengths like in a way that like actually made sense like so often i don't know like i i'm i'm kind of like over the whole like sci-fi like making op women is feminist and it's like well i guess but Mm -hmm. i don't know like guys don't always have to be op to be interesting characters i mean sorry well i don't like guys i don't like guys either Right. Yeah. I think that's the thing is it's, it goes for like every every character is it's like mm-hmm. having having ridiculously OP characters in general is mm-hmm. yeah. just like kind of like, meh. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's not, like sometimes it's fun, but also other times, like like sometimes I just want to, I just want a cool character that will just like kick everyone's ass. Like sometimes it's very cathartic. <laughs> but it's even more interesting when they can do that and also be an interesting character. It's one of the reasons right. I liked uh, Birds of like Birds of Prey is because mm-hmm. like in some way like a lot like the, the female that like there was a little tinge of a Mary Sue in Birds of Prey, but I think it was done well. See, I actually didn't think there was because I thought they had to work for it all the time. Like, yes, it, I mean, Birds of Prey is a movie about uh, about four women who fight really well. I mean, yes, like, I guess I mean, they, like that was there was like a fairly like. Well, mm-hmm. I guess that's not true. Like, I was going to say that there was like a fairly quick like combat glow up, but I guess that's yeah. not true. It's like it's more like that she develops independence really quickly, which I don't. I, which yeah. okay, I take it back. I take it back. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, you and know, that's true know, though I, too. Yeah. I, but you know, I, I complained about certain shows about like some women only being seen as like physical figures um and like they aren't allowed to have relationships but you know joss whedon does this too with like buffy he like like buffy can't have like a happy relationship uh with anyone um because you know her position i guess it's like a superhero thing to some degree though like um peter parker is allowed to be happy more of the time uh like you know i am a superhero i'm a physical person i cannot be with you it is dangerous mm-hmm. or I, I or my purpose is to like serve the world. I can't be a fully re- well-rounded character. It's very <laughs> annoying. Um, mm-hmm. Which like are like James Bond and all the disposable women. I don't think women are disposable. <laughs> I think James Bond thinks the women are disposable, like the franchise. It's why I can't watch a James Bond movie without being annoying about it. So one of my big ones, actually, I guess it's it's two of them. It's the the way diversity is done in um in in lots in of media. All things. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like gender or racial essentialism, and I don't like color mm-hmm. by number diversity. Like, yes, I understand that it is important to have racial representation and gender representation. However, um, we we've reached trope land where where every ensemble is the power rangers right okay. <laughs> you know we there are two girls there are, okay so uh, any, any group of people must be two white guys one black person um and two women and one racial other that's not black or white and then you can mix things up such that um you can mix things up such that like you might you know one of the black the black character might be female the Asian, you know, the Asian or Hispanic character might be female, um, but, you know, you have to have at least one white and w- one white male and female because they have to date. And then, you know, like there's and this this happens. And they should both be like, the, even if it's in a group, they should both be like the, the real main characters. Right. Right. And, and this happens in now what this is doing this is, is it's trying to get rid of the whiteness of friends to talk about something we talked about earlier. Right. Friends is you know, six people who hang out together, they have no other, they have no other friends that like they really hang out with and everybody is, you know, attractive and white. And you know, you know what, as much as people might have complained that we're the black people on that show, they didn't have any black friends. There are a lot of white people in New York that don't have any black friends. <laughs> that's, you know, that's who they were. And, uh, and, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a problem either way, because I don't like when they have a, a group of friends set up to where here we're going to have the tokens. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and then, it's, and then even, in, and then when you have that group, you have the very classic, you know, gender and racial roles. Well, you know, he's the black guy. So he's got, so he's streetwise. She's the girl. So she's sweet. You know, she's the other girl. So she is the badass, even though she's petite, you know, <laughs> like they're like, um, and probably also quirky. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I was Man, thinking <laughs> she's the manic pixie badass. Right. Right. So, and like where everybody, <laughs> where everybody follows a very, you know, um, here's the guy with glasses. So he's the smart one, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. you know, so over reliance on stereotypes and archetypes, I, I think are in order to, in order to make your diversity team just irritates me. Do we have any other comments we wanted to cover before? We- um, I've got one to end on that. I know Wayne will have. Okay, because <laughs> it's because it's one we've talked about before, um, and this we've talked about it in relation to um, to comic books where it really makes no sense, but it happens in TV shows and movies as well. Why bother to do a climax when you can just have somebody tell you about it on the news? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what am I talking about? Uh, most of Brian Bendis' run on anything. I- <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, that's an overstatement, but yeah, it, it's one of my pet peeves. I I think it was what Secret Invasion. Yeah, 
Secret or, Invasion is a comic we, book miniseries. It's like six issues long, and for five, and for five, right. issues, four issues of build up. Five issue five is the start of a fight, and issue six is and, and it crossed over into every other book for six months. So it, yeah. it was it was six issues long, but it was a thousand issues long. <laughs> and he sets up this. Here's the final battle in 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 Washington D.C. and and next issue, and the next issue starts with Luke Cage laying in bed with his wife, saying, "So here's what happened in D.C. last week." <laughs> <laughs> and you know basic writing show don't tell yeah and it I just, under- it just, I understand it, why you do this in a, in a movie where you ran out of budget yeah like, but this is a comic book <laughs> you, you had to draw it anyway <laughs> It's not really any easier to draw people talking than it is to draw them fighting. And just any any sense of and like you know, okay, it's a big superhero crossover book. Guess what? The good guys win. I know that going into it, but part of it is seeing that play out. Not have Luke Cage tell me about it, you know, as while I'm serving as his wife's proxy. <laughs> the, the other one that Ben just likes to do a lot, and and and, it's, and this happens on t- on on tv shows a lot um it's happened i've been watching the boys and i'm sure they're doing it to save money yeah but there's a but there because you know this actually is filmed right and and filming battles cost a lot of money so there are a lot of um and now we will cut away to a news report where the news reporter tells us what happened in the battle and then you interview somebody yeah (laughs) oh yeah there were aliens everywhere and they blew up so many buildings. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we're cost cutting measure. We're not showing you any of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a pet peeve. <laughs> so we resolved nothing. Uh, we've, re- we've resolved nothing. I, yeah, I, I, I feel like the main thing I've come away from this is we probably need to do another pet peeve show because I, I, I we've only I've gotten through like more. two major genres. Yeah, yeah we, we also like didn't get to all the comments, some of which were really good too. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, yeah, definitely, definitely go read the comments if you're listening to this. Well, yeah, you know, t- yeah. time and leave one of your own, actually. And then we'll mention it on a future episode. Maybe yeah. time is <laughs> man. You're really good about this day. Time isn't the enemy of us all. Unfortunately, we wasted some of our time watching things we apparently don't enjoy. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes a good hate watch is just just, you know, that's what you need. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, they're COVID times is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> what What is it going to be like when we have to like go back to like well, not this? I don't know. I think we so I, I will read one more comment because um, this is from from Josie, who's been on the show, because she actually said something that I that I thought was really interesting. She goes, um, queer baiting comes to mind. It's something I can mm. it's something I can sometimes put up with, depending on the quality of the show and the dimensionality of the characters involved, and also because hope springs eternal. Probably the most extreme example of that for me was Rizzozzi and Isles. The queer baiting involving the two main characters got super egregious, but for reasons, but for but for a few seasons, I was like, "That's cool, bait me, I'm, it's fine," <laughs> because like, and what she's getting at is like, there is a point where even if these tropes that we're not compl- that we're complaining about, I think there's certainly an acceptance of it right like the reason we notice them enough to be irritated by is because we've watched enough media that we continue to watch that continues to use them right i mean yeah like, well <laughs> i own i i, I have it i have a like a shame i own all 10 seasons of friends <laughs> um, <laughs> So there's nothing wrong with liking liking friends. You can like friends, but I you can mean, also whine about it. I mean, it's we can do both. We are nuanced, Ooh. complete people, <laughs> unlike many TV shows characters. Yes, characters. Yes, you can have multiple thoughts simultaneously, sometimes in tension with one another. You mean that's why being human is very weird? You mean I can both <laughs> yes. critique and love something at the same time? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's shocking. There are, in fact, multiple fields built upon this very premise. It, it confuses everyone to know this. I know. It's mind blown. Do you think I can get a PhD in one of those subjects, maybe? I don't know. You could. Know. It'd be mostly useless, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably also have very conflicted feelings about it. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> well, that took a turn for the weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is what happens when we record this late. Yeah. Well, Hannah, anything you want to promote? You can follow me on Twitter at Hallie Rogers. Maybe you'll see my newest hate watch tweet. <laughs> I, hey, my last one was super funny. Uh, it was. Katya. Uh, you can always find me on Instagram at just that nerd kid. Um, I, I promise nothing funny. 
on mine, unfortunately. <laughs> Just, I promise sewing. I can guarantee that. You had a really pretty dress um, yesterday. Excuse me, I always have a very pretty dress. Okay. In fact, that was a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it wasn't yesterday. No, I'm trying to remember. Um, and maybe it wasn't yesterday. No, you 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 definitely posted what I would call a dress recently. I um, have d- well, recently, like in in days. Yeah, uh, yeah see, that's the that, that's that's the problem. Time's lost meaning. I live in. <laughs> no, okay, I'm so, but, I'm gonna throw in one more pet peeve. I hate when social media does ruins their timelines because Instagram does yes. not show you things in, in order, order anymore. So for all I know, Mav saw a picture today that I actually posted two weeks ago because it's decided because of some algorithm voodoo. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally anyway. looking. I'm, I'm literally going into my Instagram on my phone because I'm like, no, I swear it was a dress. I, <laughs> I posted a dress like on the. It, it, I just looked it up. But the last dress I posted was August 29th. Um, Before, after that, it was a political rant about craft, which is relevant for future episode. The one that, uh, the one that I. And then the one that I'm referring to is August twenty second. So yes, <laughs> so the one that I'm referring to is August twenty second. So yeah, it, it was not yesterday. You're right. I saw it yesterday. <laughs> See, and this is this awesome. hence again my pet peeve because Instagram screws with things, and I don't like it. I I I dislike it. I don't. No. Nope. Well, anyway. Nope. Let, let, let me do. You make lots of pretty clothes. I like one I make in pretty particular. Things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make pretty things. I occasionally post, I don't know, stuff in my stories about nerd things. I don't know. It's, that was my resounding endorsement of my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, been a long day, guys. Yeah. It's just, tell about, it's Wayne, cool. tell us about your pretty dresses. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm wearing one at the moment. I, uh, no, I yeah, I guess I'll I'll pimp my Instagram again. It's T E T R O C twenty twelve. Uh you'll see my daily photography and if you like it, go to Redbubble and buy some shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you can follow me on Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram, all the places, always at Chris Maverick. You can follow the show on or at Vox Popcast on all those places or on our blog at www.voxpopcast.com, where you have a chance to comment on our upcoming ideas and give us your thoughts so that we can include them in the show as we do research and as we talk about them. Sometimes we even pick people to be guests on the show. If you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, then please leave us a reading on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. And especially uh, if you use iTunes, Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review and write a little something, something that helps the algorithm. It makes us more popular, helps other people find the show. We would also appreciate it if you'd go to YouTube and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel because that helps us. And we're trying to we're trying to get to YouTube has a weird gaming thing where you have to like game the algorithm in order to unlock more features. And we need more subscribers. So go go subscribe. Um, We just put up uh, I just put up a new video today as we record, which I thought was really nice. And I mean, it's, it's just the show, but it's the show with visual representations and and of whatever we're talking about. I would like to thank Maximilian of Thought for Music for our epic theme song building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd like to thank you at home for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. It was beyond my wildest imagination that I would one day become the notorious RBG. <laughs> if I am notorious, it is because I had the good fortune to be alive and a lawyer in the late 1960s, then and continuing through the 1970s. For the first time in history, it became possible to urge before courts successfully that equal justice under law requires all arms of government to regard women as persons equal in stature to men.